All right. That was good. Was that Hello good? There? I think that's great. All right. I what do you really want to What do you really want to know now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's. I guess I didn't ask hard enough. Um, yeah, I did, I'm glad you didn't ask about. Well, hey guys, hi, it is Brent Abel, webtennis.com. Hope you're having a spectacular day so far, wherever you are out there, as you listen to this episode of the Web Tennis Show, the Web Tennis Podcast. And uh, today's today's show is features a guy who I've just recently gotten to know uh, on Facebook, uh, a funny, funny guy, a true character. And someone back from what I think was one of the great periods of tennis back in the 70s, the late 70s especially, in terms of American tennis. And, and so uh, uh, I, I think that you're really going to have some fun with this guy. His name is Gary Plock, originally from Kentucky. Went to the University of Texas when they were loaded. And Gary ended up playing number one ahead of the great Kevin Curran and also Steve Denton. And, uh, and really what we're going to talk about today is a match that Gary and Kevin Curran played together, the semis of the NCAA doubles in 1978 against, uh, against John McEnroe and a very good friend of mine, a guy, Bill Mays. So guys, sit back and enjoy this uh, light chat with, uh, with Gary Plock. Well, Gary, good morning. What's going on? Not too much. Just uh, enjoying the day. How are you doing, Brent? I'm doing really well. Listen, I really appreciate you taking some time, and, and I'm just so curious about, you know, we've recently become Facebook friends, and uh, just following you, got I mean, uh, some really fun stuff, and I'm so curious to ask you, I guess specifically about that 1978 NCAA uh, doubles win against Bill Mays and John McEnroe. Mays, Mays are, of course, one of my all time very close, very best friends and and uh but I wanna I wanna kinda go back and start with that season, that NCAA season. Um uh, and uh as we were just talking about before we started the recording, I mean you mentioned that God, you guys were so loaded. I mean you played number one, you had Kevin Curran who ended up becoming what, a top five player in the world. I think he got ranked number two in the doubles at one point. You had Steve Denton on that team. I mean, on paper, you guys were loaded. Um, unfortunately, did not get selected to play in the NCAA team event that year. So, but, but kind of take us back and kind of lay the groundwork on that 1978 season that you guys had at the, at the University of Texas. Okay. Well, uh, from what I remember, um, because it's been a long time ago, I guess we were – we were probably one of the uh, one of the better teams uh, in the top 16. Probably, however, there's some circumstances that prevented us from getting there. We had a couple of uh, junior college walk-ons that were actually from up your way, Northern Kyle, a, a guy named Dick Jones, who is now I think called Dial Jones. I don't know if you know him or not. Yeah, right, but right, right. He was yeah. on the team, and another fellow named Doug Swallow, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, we were playing uh, in the uh, spring break. We always went down to a tournament in uh, Mexico in San Luis Potosi. That was a small pro tournament. And uh, we went down there, and uh, Kevin and I traveled together, Kevin Curran. And Kevin, being from South Africa, couldn't get into Mexico, so uh, he actually borrowed one of the guys, Doug's, I think, uh, driver's license or something and <laughs> we went through customs with the, him with with this other guy's uh uh license so fortunately we did not get thrown in jail and for the rest okay. of our lives in mexico uh, as okay. could have happened i guess sure and what one of the crazy things that you do when you're young that you're not really thinking about it but uh looking back on that that was uh pretty wild and and the reason i'm bringing that up is because we were Kevin and I were playing doubles. I think Kevin uh, beat a real good player named Steve Dockerty that was up from uh, northern, I guess, the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I lost to a guy named George Hardy. And then we played in the doubles, and it was Easter weekend when everybody travels in Mexico because everybody's Catholic. And uh, 
we were in the finals of the doubles, and I think we were playing maybe Marcella, Lara, and someone else. And before the doubles was Easter Day, I think, on that Sunday, and before the uh, finals of the doubles, the clouds got black, and all of a sudden it started hailing hail balls about the size of baseballs, the biggest wow. hail balls I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, it was just just black and so you know we were we had to get home because we had a match with South Carolina uh, Tim Mayotte's brother Chris Mayotte was playing number one and they were coming into Austin and this was before the world of cell phones and instant communication and we were down there and so we went to the you know divided the pesos up which there weren't many of them between the four contestants and went to the train station to try to get back to Austin and and uh, what happened was it started getting clear again and so the officials were calling us back and they came to the train station and we were hiding because we had to get back and we weren't going to go back and play that match so what happened was we got on that train we bribed somebody to get on the train because it was full and started our way back to America and uh, anyway we got back down to I guess Laredo and we hardly had any money left and we didn't really know but the coach had had a rent a car in Laredo waiting for us but we didn't know that so we we hitchhiked and hitchhiked with some uh, fella in a truck and it was kind of wild because we ended up in San Antonio and somehow took a plane from 60 miles from San Antonio to Austin and we were flying over the courts, and there was looked down. There was Texas playing, <laughs> and so we were we missed that match and we lost that wow. match, and so that's kind of the reason we didn't get picked. I think South Carolina was probably ranked around that 16, and they took top 16 teams. And so the reason I'm saying that is because we didn't play that uh, that uh, match against South Carolina. We didn't get in the NCAA's. Uh, and so what happened was uh, we went and played another pro tournament in Mobile to get ready for the NCAAs, and we won that. We beat Tim Wilkinson and someone in the finals. And um, anyway, uh, so we got back to NCAAs, and uh, there was uh, McEnroe and Mays playing. They were playing the team event, and I think I think when I looked back at, at an article preparing for this that I read where they played like I don't know how many days in a row and how many matches but they were uh, they were tired once the individual tournament came because I, I believe they won the uh, team tournament that year if I'm not mistaken and they did. Um, that's right yeah and so and so you know they uh, they we were playing the individual and I lost to Elliot Telcher uh, Six four in the third, a real close match, but it was in the third round. Had a pretty good tournament. I beat a fellow named Ricky Meyer that went on to be a pretty good pro, and and That's right. uh, That's right. thought I was gonna thought I had a good draw because I was you know if I could have beaten Telcher, I could have played Sadry and and uh, who I'd beaten before. And anyway, long story short, Kevin lost to a guy named Eddie Edwards out there out there from Pepperdine and. Um, so we were fairly fresh, you know, we played, uh, we were down a set and four, one in the second round of the doubles to Tut Bartson and Randy Crawford, who were a really good team from TCU. I think Randy Crawford was one of the four or five best in the country that year and in singles. And, uh, and somehow we won that match. And, and then, uh, I know we played, uh, Chris Lewis and, not the New Zealand Chris Lewis, but the Southern Cal Chris Lewis and his partner uh, Robert Van Hoff and had a good win there in the, in the quarters. And then we're going to play the semifinals against John and Bill and uh, Dead Gummit. If uh, those guys weren't playing each other in singles that morning, and uh, right. so we were That's just right. sitting around all day and we watched the match. And Bill, who was a, a great player. Uh, and who, who had just a huge serve, and it was a fast court game. And they, I believe, they split the first two sets, and and uh, John ended up winning in four sets, I believe. But it was a long match, and 
they were they were worn out. I, I know, and we played them later in the afternoon. So, so we really had it, had kind of everything in our favor. We were fresher, and we just uh, had three thousand people in the stands, and it seemed like most of them were for us because we were the underdog. And the other thing he mentioned about playing you guys is he said the first thing was. They just kicked our asses. He said Kevin was serving bombs, and and Gary was serving these twisters that he said we just could not break serve. And so whether or not they were tired, I mean the the sense I got from Bill was that uh, that they just couldn't do anything against your guys' serve. So I mean I gotta believe Kevin. I mean Kevin was just a big serving monster must have been kind of fun being his partner uh, to be able to clean up a lot of, you know, a lot of returns that just kind of got, kind of got set up for you. So I mean, playing with Kevin, uh, anything that, that was, that really stands out in your mind about being a, a partner with him or being a partner with a guy who serves that big? Well, you know, it's uh that makes me feel good that you say that because if I, in a tennis magazine I read in 18, 1985, Vic Braden was talking about how Kern hits the biggest serve in the world, and he did a, a, a four-page layout on that term. And about in the middle of the article, he said, "I, you know, I learned my serve from Gary Plock, a guy that played on our one on our tennis team, and wow. I learned to hit on the rise, which which I learned from uh, Roscoe Tanner." kind of a unique uh, unique kind of delivery and, and, you know, hit on the rise where you hit it and then it's gone. But uh, um, so Kevin was actually a kind of a baseliner when he came to Texas. He played number six on the team at at first, and um, he was better than that. But, uh, you know, getting acclimated to America and tennis over here takes a little while. And uh, but he was, uh, you know, Cliff Drysdale kind of told our coach about him, and and uh, and he came over at mid semester, and and so he played that first semester, and and just just got into the lineup actually. So he was not a big server when he came there, and I don't know that I remember teaching him do this and do that, but I think he just saw my serve and, and learned. So it's funny that everybody talks. Well, Denton and Curran had these great big serves, but. You know, the reason I didn't ever lose to them in a challenge match and did play ahead of them was because yeah, I, I had a huge serve. I, I wasn't very athletic, and but I was left-handed, and it was, uh, you know, a serve that would go just in the corners all the time with with a heavy slice and, uh, and then a second serve that I developed that was just a reverse kick uh, that would hit and then kick the other way, which... Uh, which was kind of, you know, back then with fast courts, kind of like California courts used to be, I guess. Uh, you know, if you had a good volley and you could get one break a set, and that's kind of how I played. So um, when people talk about Kevin serve and Steve serve, you know, usually I just smile and say, yeah, they had big serves. But uh, uh, actually Kevin was very long and had long arms, long legs, so – one of our great successes was the fact that I was, you know, I was the one never broken. We we lost to uh, Nichols and, and uh, Austin in the finals and got blown away, and I think a lot of that was to do with the fact that we had such a big win the day before that, you know, we just seemed flat, you know, and it's kind of like right. maybe Bill Bill and John were in the semis. It just, I don't know what happened, but I remember McEnroe saying, God, how did you guys lose to those guys? They're terrible, you know, which is classic <laughs> McEnroe. But um, I, was, I don't know. But uh, but basically, you know, the reason that they broke Kevin, I think, is John Austin. They were hitting balls right at me at the net. and We really hadn't experienced that where they just go right at me. And I was usually right on top of the net, and I hadn't seen that kind of return uh, in a while. But. But to get back to what your question was about current, sure, it was great. I was I, I was a, a really good volleyer and really good at anticipating. So, you know, we we won maybe, you know, like I say, we won that pro tournament down there in Mobile against some really good players, and uh, we just didn't we just didn't lose serve. And uh, of course, Kevin, you know, it was a three it was a no ad th- thing, and he was so 
uh, superstitious and nervous all the time. He never wanted to take the three all points, and he had a much better return than me, and we had a much better mm. chance with him serving, but he was just, uh, you know, unsure a lot. So uh, that senior year, I finally got him to start taking those no-ed points. But uh, anyway, yeah, it was fun for both of us because, you know, we were putting volleys away all the time at the net and, and did not get broken too much at all. As a matter of fact, you, I, don't uh, know if, I don't know if we lost any doubles matches that year or not. I guess we did, but I can't remember who. But I think maybe not. We we won like 40-something matches in a row because in Texas you would play those fall tournaments as well. But it was uh, it was sure fun back then. That was that was That's a great, great. honor yeah. playing yeah. with him. Looking back on it, and and then my but before uh, Kevin got there, or I guess Kevin's freshman year, I played uh, played doubles with Steve Denton, so uh, who was my roommate in college. So I had the luxury of a lot of big servers to play with. That's cool. That's cool. Well, speaking of roommates, you mentioned before we started recording a little story about rooming with Bill Mays when you guys were, I guess, on the Junior Davis Cup team. And I think it's pretty funny, uh, and I can see I can see Bill reacting to it. But one of the things that Bill told me yesterday is he thought that maybe in that match that um, you were doing the uh, that you were doing the uh, the tobacco, the you know the chew during the match, and then spitting it out somewhere in the can and side changes. And as you told me, no, that did not happen then. But there might have been another time when you and Mazer got together where uh, there was a little a little tobacco. I'd love to hear that story again. Uh, yeah, Bill may not remember that, but I just remember he was he was saying I, I would I used to do this stuff the skull uh, that Earl Campbell I think turned me on to. He was a later up spokesman for it, but um, that's right. They said, I'd like to try some of that. Put a little, they'd say, put a little dip, uh, pinch between your cheek and gum was how the commercial went. It was, I guess, when Earl, before he was pro, I think Walt Garrison was the spokesman for that company. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, he said, okay, well, you can try some. And he tried some and, and started turning blue and got sick as a dog. And I don't think he, I don't think he became a skull brother. But uh, Bill was a, a very interesting person not not only was he one of the greatest juniors of our time uh he was the i think i remember him beating billy martin who never got beat in the juniors and and uh uh, and i said wow this guy has got a talk about a guy that had a huge serve bill mays had a huge serve he his serve was ever bit as good as kevin current and uh and just just a wonderful fella he Turned me on to uh, the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, and uh, mm. you know, mm-hmm. used to quote some little passages out of it, and was just kind of a, a cerebral guy and a real thoughtful and 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 kind person, you know. And uh, you, you kind of remember guys like that uh, that that were just ultimate gentlemen, you know. Ferdy tagging them, Eli being another one, but Bill was Bill was always low key and laid back and uh and and very thoughtful and intelligent person and another one of those guys that you didn't see and read about at the Wimbledon finals and US Open and everything but you know he was every bit as good as um, uh, for example Bill Scanlon who you know was a great player and Bill and I Bill and I played singles quite quite a bit in several tournaments one I guess one thing that I'll bring up is when uh, we were members of the Junior Davis Cup team in 18 and unders two, and the way that came about is that everybody had a record, and then at the end, like six or eight, eight, I guess eight guys got chosen to be on the team according to their record through the the uh, tryouts up at Port Washington on the clay and. Then they threw everybody else in a tournament, and I remember, remember I beat uh, Tony Giamalva and Matt Mitchell, who were, you know, Matt Mitchell being a hard court player. It was probably a little unfair that we had those on clay, but um, then in the finals, you know, going to play Bill Mays, and whoever won the tournament got on the Junior Davis Cup team, and 
he was up 6-0-5-0 on me on the clay. And, uh, you know, later that summer, I got to the semifinals of the National Junior Clay Courts and grew up in Louisville where the tournament was. So I was very good on clay. And Bill was from Northern Cal and played on hard court. So I said, boy, I've got a good chance here. And he won the, ripped off the first 11 games and, I won the next two, so he beat me 6-0, 6-2, and, and he shook my hands and said, boy, I was really scared once I lost those two games that you were going to come back in and, and Bill May's fashion. So that was, yeah. that, was, that was fun. And then after the match, uh, they ended up putting, making it an even 10, and so I got to be on team two. Uh, That's cool. So that was, That's cool. that was interesting. And then later, I guess my other Bill May's uh, – match we were in uh, raleigh north carolina at the uh, southern men's championships and i had i had just beaten bill scanlon had a really good win and uh and then i played him and and he was ahead a set and 5-0 in the second set and 40 love in the second set i i don't know if you've had that that experience before where you're where you're down and you come back but that was my ultimate win i came back and won that match and uh I just remember wow. we played for a long time, and he just came up to the net, shook my hand just like he did at Davis Cup, and he just said, "Too tough," <laughs> you know, and that was it. <laughs> That's so, great. Well, one listen, of my favorite, a, uh, one of my favorite guys. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't, uh, I'm going to send you a link to a video on YouTube where. He was inducted, Bill, Bill Mays was inducted into the uh, NorCal, USA NorCal Hall of Fame a few years ago. And his, his induction speech is one of the funniest things I have ever seen. And it's totally off the cuff. He's got no notes. And it's in, just as you described, Gary, it's in complete Mays style. It is that dry sense of humor. And uh, I'm going to send you a link to it because I think that you'll really, really enjoy it. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'd love to see it. Yeah. So, well, listen, so what are, you, uh, what are you doing these days? Are you still in the tennis industry? Are you still working? Are you still playing? What are you doing with the, what are you, what are you, doing with the game? I'm, you know, it's, it's funny that we were talking about serving. I'm, I'm kind of semi-retired. I was in the insurance business and, and then the real estate business, and, and it, but I've also always taught tennis and, and been in tennis programs and run college camps and through the, you know, the 40 years afterwards and uh, never been too far away from it. But, and now I'm, I've moved down to Florida and I have a daughter that's down here in law school. And so I, I, I still teach a little bit of tennis and, uh, and still do a little real estate down here in Florida. And I'm starting to do some videotapes on, uh, on serving and the art of serving and, and the complexity and the of serving and the variation of, for example, what is a first serve, what is a second serve? Because I, I watch these matches of these these great and I'm mostly women pros. It looks like the men, most of the men do have complete serves, but you know some of these pros have like C minus second serves. You know I, I'm thinking like a, a Dementieva of the past who is top three or four in the sure. world and. Just right. couldn't get a third, second serve, you know, and and it's just amazing that uh, that nobody has has really learned I, other than I guess I remember Sam Stoser being able to really kick her second serve, but by right. and large, right. um, by and large, they're just throwing it in, you know, and um, and so I'm I'm trying to do some videotape uh, and that just some short tips, uh, several tips and putting a little website together on the, the serve and, and just how how uh, complex it really is. And, and uh, for example, uh, you know, how a first serve should be related to how a pitcher pitches in baseball in terms of varying it. The other thing that I see a lot, even in the pros, is, you know, people hitting the serve to the same place all the time. And relying on power rather than seeing a, a Roger Federer who's so effective by, by where he puts it and, and, and with the spin that he uses even on the first serve and, and how that's done because I, I was a, a physiologist and kinesiologist by training and studies. and So I, I kind of went back and learned, well, well, what did I do and how did I learn this to, where I could 
because I knew early on, not being a great athlete, that I was going to have to get an advantage somewhere. And, and I learned that, you know, in tennis, you first have to learn to control the ball. And uh, if you can control the ball better than someone else and make them move, then you're going to do pretty well. And that is a weapon in itself. And then, you know, the first serve and then, more importantly to me anyway, and, and what Jack Kramer used to harp on all the time was, you know, a second serve and, you know, what, how, how, how important that is in, in the scheme of things. So I'm doing a little bit of that just to try cool. to get it out there, not to make a big bunch of money on it, but just to try to see if somebody can take it and, and uh, learn awesome. from it. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, listen, I, Want to be respectful of your time, uh, Gary. So I really appreciate this. It's been a lot of fun. It's been fun get, get, getting to know you on Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing a little social media now. You're a funny guy, and I always look forward to seeing whatever you're posting. And, um, uh, again, thanks for your time today, and let's stay in touch. Well, Brent, it's always, always nice to talk to a national champion. <laughs> well, congratulations. You, know, you should have given those guys a few more games, though. <laughs> we're just trying to live in, the, in the, we're just trying to be more like the Gary Plocks and those guys out there. Where, you, know, you don't want to do that. Play much, we didn't play much junior tennis in college and kind of got a late start and just trying to still figure the game out. It's a lot of fun, obviously, a game for a lifetime. So, Gary, hey, man, thanks a lot, and I'll look forward to uh, seeing whatever you've gotten to serve in those videos. And um, come on, man. Have a great day out there today. So thank you, Brent. Thanks for calling. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. That was good. Was that so good? That, I think that's great. All right. What do you really want to, what do you really want to know now? <laughs> well, that's, I guess I didn't ask hard enough. Um, yeah, I did, I'm glad you didn't ask about me. And- so, guys, there you have it. Really hope you enjoyed uh, that chat with, with Gary Plock. And we'll leave the rest of the, uh, the chat on the cutting room floor. Um, look, man, really a, a great guy, funny guy, and uh, I, I really enjoyed my time with him today. So, Guys, would love to hear from you. If you enjoyed uh, this interview with Gary, uh, let us know down below. If there's anywhere to comment or to like or to share or whatever social media love you can give, I would really appreciate that. If nothing else, uh, it really helps get this podcast out to more tennis players out there who might enjoy uh, this kind of a conversation with um, some of the great players uh, that we've had in our game. Guys, as always, come on now. you got to get out there today and make it another incredible day.